been having some deep dives into some of the physical science, and we'll get to do something a little different, but kind of fits into the feel and culture of what we do here in CPEP, which is really thinking about climate and people and their intersections with the environment. And I think this is kind of like the perfect CPEP sounding abstract you can imagine. Oh, thank you. Yes. So our speaker today is Jason Mishnek. Like it was good. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, who uh, joined UW Madison uh, last year uh, in the Department of Geography, where he's a postdoc, and also with the Integrated Biology Zoology Museum uh, out in Nolan Hall, uh, where he's a scientist. Uh, prior to coming here, he got his PhD from UC Davis in evolutionary anthropology. And I asked him a little bit about how he got into this topic, and he, we started talking about leftover foods and remains and how kind of trying to understand people and culture through what's uh, you know left is in traces in the environment is kind of something about how we don't necessarily think about and how we learn about people. And so we'll be learning a little bit about that today and this topic of climate resilience in the archaeological record in the study of the North and Sound of Alaska. And with that I'll turn it over to you. Thank you Anchor for that uh, great introduction. And thank you all for coming in uh, today. Uh, very excited to uh, speak to uh, all of you uh, uh, today. Uh, ever since I kind of came to uh, Madison a couple of uh, years ago, I really wanted to kind of get to know the Nelsons to do a little more. So uh, I'm thrilled by this opportunity today. Um, just before I jump into things, I just want to acknowledge that uh, UW Madison is on the unceded land of the Ho-Chunk Nation, uh, who holds the land of Jobe. And my own research takes place uh, on the traditional homeland of the Yukon people and uh, Nubak people of Western Alaska, who uh, currently inhabit the area that I work in and are collaborators on the project. So let's jump right into things. Um, the work that I'm presenting today is an extension of my dissertation research and will eventually feed into my postdoctoral research. Full disclosure, I was uh, planning on to have kind of more of my postdoctoral work integrated into this talk, but uh, lab work got pushed from the summer to the fall, and I just came back from kind of extensive lab work in Seattle, uh, so kind of <laughs> barely adjusting the time zone difference. So uh, these are kind of still kind of ideas in motion, and I would love to hear your feedback on this. So my work mostly takes place in Norton Sound, Alaska. It's a shallow body uh, inlet in uh, western Alaska on the uh, North Bering Sea. And it's this interesting zone as it's kind of this uh, uh, transitionary zone between warmer kind of boreal uh, waters of the uh, Pacific and then cool, cooler uh, Arctic waters of the Arctic Oceans. It's also an interesting kind of cultural zone too where you have uh, transition zone too where you have kind of cultures from both north um, and uh, interior and the south all kind of coming in at this area. Um, so this work started uh, with UC Davis, so where I did my uh, dissertation work. And it started in 2013, and it was in collaborative collaboration with the native village of Shaktula. And um, these are mostly kind of eco uh, economic and kind of subsistence uh, hunters and fishers. And their town is situated on this kind of, I'm going to show pictures of it later, but this nice kind of spit that straddles kind of salmon-rich rivers and a north-bearing sea. And this kind of sweet spot, an remember the sweet spot you can think of. Um, and this is definitely true uh, for uh, kind of free industrial hunter-gatherers as well. So the goal of the collaborative project with the community is to uh, trace back ecological um, human responses in the, in the region for, for the, over the last 4,500 years. And uh, research questions are very much uh, stimulated and uh, kind of inspired by community members. So here's just kind of a few kind of shots of myself, a little bit younger, <laughs> more enthusiastic, not quite grinded down by my PhD yet. Uh, and some community members. So we, we have uh, high school interns who are always uh, going to work with us. Uh, uh, we do school tours in September. Um, so it's a great place to work. Now in 2019, uh, we were hit with a massive storm. I and mean, as kind of these transient kind of field workers, um, even just us coming each summer, we kind of noticed the, the noticeable signs of climate change. And specifically what happened to us in 2019 is that where we were, uh, camp between the river and the ocean, uh, basically both of those rose up and flooded us out. And this was uh, an anomaly because yes, these storms happen, but they never really happen in August. And this is a trend that 
people of Chakchuk were seeing more recently and recently, where these big fall storms are happening uh, earlier in the season and more frequently. And this is a huge immediate uh, danger to people of Chakchuk, who you can kind of see kind of that, you know, that environment described, the river and the ocean, that rising sea levels will lead to erosions of the spit that will immediately um, affect their clean drinking water, but also uh, uh, are a clear warning to the, uh, sorry, danger to the uh, infrastructure of the town that faces basically uh, the threat of the ocean coming into town. And in 2019, the gravel seawall that they're building actually collapsed, um, bringing them the number one uh, community at risk of uh, climate change disaster in all of Alaska. So th this this is this is not a shack tool of kind of problem specific. You see this all across the Arctic. You see this all across Alaska, where um, there are kind of several kind of threats of climate change. So increased ocean temperatures are um, changing um, the ecology of the region. It's uh, limiting um, uh, sea ice extent, which is a uh, both a threat for subsistence hunters who hunt seals, but also for uh, calving grounds for those kind of marine mammals and seals. And um, coastal erosion as well as changing ecosystems. Uh, one big thing that we've seen kind of year round and year round is uh, this decrease in sa Pacific salmon spawning. Either their runs are um, kind of dwindled to a point of kind of not being economically viable or they're just not coming. And uh, this is actually also changing the ecosystem as well. Uh, traditionally the uh, North Bering Sea is this uh, tightly uh, coupled benthic environment where basically ice algae comes down and feeds this rich benthos sea stars and crabs and then uh, fish eat this and then uh, marine mammals eat that and people eat the marine mammals. But with rising ocean temperatures you're getting an ecological change where more energy is coming from the pelagic zone and it's also bringing um, large um, boreal species from the south. So kind of a question that I had after 2019 is how can we kind of mitigate the effects of climate change um, through kind of societal kind of risk. So basically the degree that uh, a given society, a kind of different culture, will be affected by climate change is largely uh, configured off of their own kind of cultural configuration. So exposure to environmental risks is but one component of a potential disaster, but it's also how are those uh, communities organized? What kind of kind of uh, fact? What, what are their food systems like? How can they kind of better mitigate the effects of climate change? Because climate change will happen, but different configurations will have to kind of different results of how that uh, climate change affects them. Those disasters triggered by natural hazards are not solely influenced by the magnitude and frequency of the hazards, but are also heavily determined by the vulnerability of the affected societies. So saddle configuration will largely determine the impact of climate change. So for me, as an archaeologist, this is kind of an interesting kind of thought experiment. Can we kind of look back at the archaeological record to identify uh, past strategies that may promote or uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of feed into uh, or, or, or de denigrate um, kind of resilience to climate change. So this is, the, this is feeding off of resilience theory, which is um, based out of kind of traditional ecology, e ecology, but has been um, applied to kind of human systems. And this basically is kind of a kind of system view of human and environmental relationships um, that is uh, looking at kind of these complex systems. So, so humans as a kind of being these naturally coupled systems. And the whole focus of resilience theory is on tolerated disturbance. So basically, how are systems maintained in uh, kind of um, the, the threat of a shock when environmental uh, change happens? How, how do they kind of maintain their function? And this is both kind of an environmental level, but also on kind of a cultural level as well. How do groups bounce back? So a state of how communities decline or collapse at other times, or how communities persist through some environmental downturns, but while others may be that's you know, kind of a harsh word, destroyed at other times. And kind of a great study kind of came out in 2016 by Nelson et al, et al. who did this uh, metadata analysis of uh, sites both in uh, north sites of Greenland and also uh, 
sites, uh, indigenous sites in the southwest, and they basically look at different factors that would have made um, these uh, cultures either vulnerable or more resilient to climate change. So they looked at societal configuration. Are, are they, do they have storage? How resilient are their food systems? So how diverse it, 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 are their kind of economies? And then they kind of uh, measured these to paleoclimactic workers and found that essentially that societies that had kind of less vulnerable systems were less um, prone to collapse. So if any of you are familiar with um, resilience theory, this is kind of the classic figure that you'll see in every kind of paper for resilience theory. This is Pauling's Lazy Eight. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot to like, there's a lot of people who talk about this. So I'm just going to do like a, a very kind of, uh, kind of a blase kind of, uh, kind of discussion of it. But so essentially with resilience theory, and we're kind of looking at these systems, there's kind of four main uh, stages. So there's a growth phase, and this is basically kind of looking at um, how kind of, in this case, kind of the society or the group you're looking at will eventually grow and then uh, hit a point of conservation where it's going to be kind of at equilibrium for a while. And then the focus then we'll kind of, we're concerned with is that when environmental change you get, uh, strikes, you get kind of this period of release where um, it kind of focus, throws that system out of whack, sorry, out of balance. <laughs> And uh, there's kind of you know, two things that can happen. There could be a reorganization, and reorganization is kind of a sign of re resilience. It kind of plays on the flexibility of the system, and it works off kind of the stored memory and kind of the mechanisms built within that system. Um, otherwise, you might have societal clubs. So in the Norton Sound, where I work, we have quite a rich archaeological record that we've uh, kind of worked on uh, since 2013. Um, we have some of the oldest human occupation in the area going back to around 4,000 years ago. Um, so first, the Denby Flume Complex. And I'll go more into these more in detail as I uh, go through my talk. Uh, followed by a gap. So this is something that, that, that's kind of interesting for the talk. So we have, we have a gap. We have a period of uh, apparent human hiatus in the area. Uh, then we have followed by the Norton culture, another gap and then another kind of pulse of human uh, occupation in the area till uh, kind of present day uh, um, human occupations. So, as I mentioned at the end of the talk, a little bit of kind of, kind of like a maybe uh, uh, kind of safety net for me. These are kind of questions I'm still kind of marinating around and I'm still kind of working with. So they're, they're not really kind of quite at a kind of the, uh, the ready-go stage yet, but a few questions that I'd like to kind of start thinking about during this talk is how did climate change affect food security in Norton Sound over the last 4,500 years? And this will be done through zooarchaeology, so basically the analysis of um, past animal remains left in uh, midden deposits that humans were kind of living in. Uh, what economic strategies were implemented to buffer against climate uncertainty? And how does settle organization or technological innovation promote resilience in North and South Alaska? And lastly, uh, how does prey species targeting promote resilience? So um, these questions kind of really focus on the, the human part of the system, but uh, it's, these are kind of paired human uh, kind of natural systems, and um, the types of animals you're going for will very much kind of uh, depend, will, will feed into the strength of kind of this, the resilience of your system. So here's a, a pretty kind of Google Earth picture of uh, our study area. So this is um, the village of Shaktula. So this is kind of, uh, you know, you see the rivers, you see, see the ocean. And we kind of have kind of two main archeological districts. We have uh, Cape Denby, which is a rocky cape, and then um, the Shaktua Peninsula, which is an asteroid system. And uh, these both have kind of clusters of archaeological sites. And uh, kind of all here is kind of a marshy uh, asteroid kind of environment. It's unlikely that people live there, but it's also possible that there's just kind of a lack of archaeological serving area. So uh, most of, uh, actually, I'll, I'll get back to this, uh, this figure uh, later on in the talk. So a little bit of the climactic context. Uh, so th these are uh, oxygen reconstructions from the Greenlandic ice core, and these are uh, sea ice reconstructions for um, the Chukchi from uh, marine um, diatoms. 
So basically, for this figure, uh, peaks are uh, greater sea ice uh, than average, and uh, valleys are kind of lesser sea ice uh, than average. So uh, this, uh, we have a lot of climate scientists in the room, and this is obviously the Holocene the epoch. Um, the middle Holocene is associated with uh, peak temperatures relative to current conditions, but then there has been a uh, kind of steady um, decrease temperatures uh, the onset of the neoglacial, which is kind of a mis misnomer uh, considering that uh, temperatures are actually quite warmer than the neoglacial. Uh, temperatures peaked uh, during the medieval climatic anomaly around 1000 CE, and then decreased in the late Holocene during the Little Ice Age. So this is kind of like, the, this is kind of the climactic um, uh, curtain that kind of we're going to be playing kind of our archaeological data against. So we kind of see this climate change, there's, a, there's warming and cooling events. How do the past people uh, uh, adapt to these changes? So the first phase I'm going to talk about, the Denby Flint Complex. This is um, some of the oldest coastal human occupation in Alaska. Um, and it's uh, part of this kind of third wave migration of people from Siberia. So we have kind of people coming in 18,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago across Bering Strait or on coastal routes. And then we have a uh, resurgence of kind of people who come out around 5,000, 6,000 years ago who can be traced back to cultures, like Neolithic cultures in Siberia. And they are kind of this mixed maritime culture. So they have um, these beautiful projectile points. Uh, they seem to be kind of mostly sedentary, uh, sorry, mostly uh, uh, nomadic. Uh, very sparse faunal records, but artifacts suggest that they're maybe hunting mostly caribou and seal. And um, the only set we have for them in the, in the area is in Cape Denby, so at this rocky point, which would have been a great kind of sealing spot. So this is the site of Ayadiat, uh, very prominent, which is excavated by uh, Andy Tremaine, one of my collaborators in uh, 2014, and it was on this uh, kind of colluvial slope, so well stratified. And what he basically found, and he did this meta-analysis of uh, dates for the um, ASTT, and found that around um, 3,500 uh, years ago, you get a collapse of ASTT uh, populations all across Alaska. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And then a subsequent um, gap until kind of the next cultural period. So, so these are some, um, pro some uh, density uh, prob probability here. So these are basically population estimates based off of radiocarbon dates. So for those of you who may not be familiar with it, um, there seems to be this gap. And basically, what he concluded, kind of his idea, is that um, this kind of population crash was caused by the eruption of Anika Jack uh, 2, which happened uh, on the uh, Alaskan Peninsula. And uh, Tefra, uh, identified at Cape Essenberg, uh, shows that kind of volcanic fallout reached uh, all the way up to the Sioux Peninsula. So the idea is that uh, these Kind of this huge catastrophic event would have um, blank, blanketed kind of the, the environment with ash, leading to caribou collapse, uh, destroying kind of vegetation. And um, this is something we can kind of talk about kind of in discussion, but um, the ASTT, kind of given kind of their technological toolkit and, the, and their kind of maybe kind of uh, subtle, subtle, subtle uh, configuration, were not able to adapt to this change. And there was a collapse. You, we do see, though, at this time that they did kind of move more to the coast, so there's kind of this change from more terrestrial components to more marine components, but eventually these populations disappear from Alaska. And then we kind of get going to our next phase. And if I, the, the Demi Flynn complex was very much characterized as this mixed marine terrestrial economy. Um, the Norton was all in for um, marine resources. So we see pottery showing up. We see um, net sinkers associated with uh, catching uh, fish. Um, and these are both, we have sites both on Cape Denby and uh, Shaftville Peninsula. And all along the uh, peninsula we have these sites as well. But another thing we can get is that we get the appearance of these large villages all across the Norton Sound. And um, this is not something we necessarily think about when we think about Arctic environments. We're talking about uh, villages that are 200 plus houses 
uh, that are um, around um, two to three meters in diameter, uh, a meter, a uh, meter and a half deep, um, that you can actually see from Google Earth. Um, here is the one that we worked on in uh, Shack Chulik, uh, Divchuk. And all these pockmarked depressions are all houses. So tightly clustered people, uh, kind of societies all living together at this time. And you see a site map right here. And um, based off ethnographies, based off the size of the house, one house could probably have held up to um, around, um, sorry, 10 people. So we were kind of thinking just like a 10% occupation at this time. Um, that, that'd be definitely a village of 100, uh, if not more. Um, So here's a kind of a nice kind of a um, drone um, shot of that site. And here's kind of one of those uh, depressions. And uh, at the site we're getting kind of mixed uh, tools. So we're getting projectile points, a lot of net sinkers, ceramics, and adzes for uh, woodworking. So a big kind of question that we had was, um, given the size of these villages, given them, and that there's not only one, but there's at least three identified north and south, how did they how are they supported? How can how can they can be ma be maintained? So that's where the power of zoo archaeology comes in. And uh, in 2018, we identified the shell midden. And um, generally, the, the preservation was very poor at the site. But given the alkaline nature of um, uh, mussel shell, it uh, counteracted the uh, acid soil. So we had a lot of kind of um, different um, kind of faunal remains popping up. And what came up specifically was, yes, there's a lot of salmon, which makes sense, because that's economically important at the time, but there's also a lot of small taxa that you wouldn't specifically think of in Arctic settings, specifically when you think of Arctic hunter gatherers, the caribou, seal, maybe salmon, but we got a lot of this small fish saffron cod that don't grow too big. We got a lot of mussels, uh, a lot of ptarmigan. So this is maybe more set for the better for the discussion, but we can actually kind of Start thinking about kind of how resilience is promoted um, in the archaeological record. So one thing is through kind of having resources that are not only diverse but seasonally abundant. So um, this is kind of all, um, all the uh, taxa that were uh, targeted. So we kind of see these kind of this flexible year-round uh, targeting of several species. So if one fails, you kind of have a backup. Another thing that uh, can promote resilience is flexible technologies. Um, anyone here try making a fishing net? No, don't. It takes a lot of time. <laughs> it's like three weeks to make a fit with one fishing net. Um, and there's always this assumption that these netting stones were used for salmon fishing, but our large um, abundance of ptarmigan in the archaeological record makes us think that they were also used for birding as well. So in terms of promoting resilience, you have this very costly technology, you put a lot of time in, um, and then, oh, salmon runs, either maybe they stopped running, maybe they didn't come, what do you do with these nets? We can turn these, uh, retie them, and use them for other taxa, such as ptarmigan or, or ducks. And ethnographically, so this is a historical example, we see this happening, this is exactly kind of the case we see in the, in the ethnographic record. Another thing we kind of see in the area is um, we see a couple of these sites occupied at the same time for the Norton phase, and that uh, there seems to be strategic landscape use where people are using kind of several points on the land for different uh, species. So using kind of local ecologies to their advantage. So we have estuary systems and then rocky caves. And in rocky caves, that those linden deposits are dominated by uh, seals, while our um, estuary systems are dominated by uh, saffron cod, um, salmon, docks, it's much more diverse. And this is not terribly surprising given the fact that um, this is kind of currently how they kind of map on the landscape. So if you just look at kind of Cape Denby, it is a very good hot spot for sealing while um, Devchuk is kind of closer to its estuary system. So strategic land, land use is a, another way of uh, mitigating kind of climate risk. So these are kind of our lovely house depressions. And we dated a bunch of, uh, how many houses do we get? So we dated around 14 houses at this point. 
And we found that for the most part, um, they're all, um, they're all uh, operate at the same time. Uh, so this site grew very fast, very immediately. Uh, but what we also find is that we have a couple of outliers right here. And there seems to be an apparent, apparent gap. And uh, this is um, not unheard of for the area. So this is actually happening at other uh, sites as well. So another site we worked on at First Bend, we see a kind of, uh, this is also on the Shaktua Peninsula, we see a similar trend of kind of an earlier occupation and then um, a later occupation. And uh, this is also marked by a kind of difference in um, artifacts. So no longer we're getting net figures and ceramics, we're getting more projectile points. We're also not no longer getting um, kind of these large, kind of densely packed uh, uh, villages, they're more spaced out. So if you want to think of kind of resilience theory, it seems like there's some sort of reorganization that occurred. Here's some of the pictures from the artifacts from the first Ben site. I couldn't stop myself, I'm an archaeologist, I just love, love these. Um, yeah, so there's a kind of smattering of it. Um, the obsidian is interesting because it would have been traded in, so this is volcanic glass. I don't know if there's any Game of Thrones fans, but this would be kind of quote-unquote dragon glass. Uh, but they would have been traded in, and there's also an increase in kind of this material this time too. But looking at all kind of Norton sites for this time in Norton Sound, we see that um, there seems to be some sort of trend. So up here is kind of a population estimates from uh, radiocarbon date um, densities. Um, this is our sea ice record, and these are two kind of pollen-based uh, climate reconstructions. And we see that there seems to have been some sort of um, population hiatus or reorganization um, coinciding with a climactic cooling. So that's very interesting. So unfortunately, we have no faunal remains for these sites. It's only right here, so it's very speculative in terms of what's happening. But across the Norton Sound, we see a decrease in settlement size and density, decreased population, less net sinkers, less ceramics, and kind of more movement towards kind of more kind of sparsely, uh, sparse populations. So reasons. Uh, this is something that's often pops in the archaeological record, but we have kind of yet to be able to essentially look at some data, is that maybe there was a decrease in salmon runs. So maybe cooling uh, spikes kind of caused salmon uh, populations to collapse, causing the uh, kind of societies to kind of uh, reconfigure. Oh man, we, we, we can't kind of live off of stored salmon anymore, and maybe our kind of fallback resources aren't kind of uh, substantial enough, so let's kind of shift away to kind of another kind of resource. But this, this, is, this is very speculative, and uh, hopefully kind of future field work will uh, kind of yield more data on what's happening at this time. So how much time do I have left? Like 20, 25 minutes. Okay, that's good enough. Good, good. That's good. I think we can make you guys. Right, so then after the uh, Nord culture, there was then another subsequent um, gap um, for around 500 years. And I think for all these gaps, I need to kind of uh, preface this that we're not sure if they're true gaps or just kind of holes in archaeological sampling. Um, despite kind of the rich archaeological history of the area, um, little uh, work has been done archaeologically, so we're still kind of navigating kind of if these are gaps or not. And kind of the next groups to come in are part of this kind of recent population push from Siberia around 1000 uh, AD. And this is kind of part of this wider kind of Thule migration around 1000 CE, where uh, groups from around Siberia and St. Lawrence Islands uh, kind of develop these like very sophisticated maritime uh, technologies and dog traction and uh, simply just exploded on the uh, uh, coastal Arctic environments. So uh, they spread from Eastern Arctic and down to Western Arctic. And uh, the groups that I previously talked about, um, there's very, this little, little genetic evidence that they're linked to modern day indigenous people. Um, but it seems that most indigenous people in coastal Arctic settings can draw their ancestry from the Thule culture, so from this kind of recent migration around 1000 CE. So in kind of the sites that we're working with, 
most of this data comes from um, the aptly named shark Shack Tulip Airport site, which is situated right next to the Shack Tulip Airport. Um, like I always say, it's great that they uh, built the site so close to the airport because it's very convenient for us. Um, <laughs> kind of joking aside, we are kind of looking for an actual, a more traditional name, but the community is still kind of um, talking it over and then deciding kind of what kind of they deem most appropriate for it. So right now it's just the airport site. And it's a very incredible site. So we look at this uh, top one night map, we see kind of all these dwellings. And um, this kind of yellow greenish is uh, an ele elevated area. And it's going to become uh, important uh, later on. And this is very much more of a palimpsest of uh, an occupation. So the other site was much more straightforward. It kind of has, has kind of the same culture, maybe two different phases. This is much more modeled. So you have kind of multiple groups kind of um, living at the same time. So uh, the first kind of uh, group kind of within the suite, and, and they seem to be all related, at least kind of um, genetically, but in terms of culturally, it's still unclear exactly if it's one group that kind of stuck around and developed, or you kind of have different people with the same culture moving in and moving out. Uh, yeah, so we have kind of this, uh, this uh, princess, and kind of a really rough uh, analysis kind of summary of uh, what we're finding in terms of the animal bones, uh, we're getting this very diverse um, estuary signature. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm a big fish guy, so a lot of anadromous fish, mostly Pacific salmon, um, but also some freshwater fish as well. Um, our, some marine uh, or, or brackish water fish is a saffron cod, so they're, they're in there again, and flatfish. It's a lot of fish bone, 30,000. Fish a lot of counting. Uh, we also got a lot of birds too. So we've got seabirds, terrestrial birds, migratory waterfowl. So once again, kind of this very diverse um, kind of food system and marine mammals as well. So and as well as terrestrial mammals. So um, very much kind of this year-round occupation using uh, a little bit of everything uh, each year. But this definitely varied kind of with each of our cultural occupations. So our first uh, the earliest sign of occupation is the Thule, who are locally known as the Nuclei. And we see that um, there's kind of very kind of little signs of uh, their houses archaeologically, and it's still currently very under tested. We only put a kind of maybe one or two test units in each of these houses, so there's still work to be done. Um, and um, one feature that we excavated here was the uh, Karigi. So this is a traditional men's house. They are common across the Arctic. They are also known as Kazgis or, 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 or Karigis. Um, and they were essentially places where men would congregate and make tools. And depending on kind of the culture and the time, they could have been uh, as extreme having kind of uh, boys and men kind of just live there kind of winter long, or kind of you know being more open kind of to the rest of kind of the, uh, the society. Uh, what we found here is that we found a dominance of uh, Pacific salmon. Um, and this is from a uh, quarter inch screen samples of material. So archaeologists archeolog have to kind of sift the, the soil that they're working with. Um, but in terms of soil samples, we then kind of see um, a lot of these saffron gods. And this is going to become important later on in the talk. So in terms of kind of the, the, the economy of the um, the area, uh, in terms of the artifacts, we see that there is a, a concentration mostly of piercing uh, fishing technology. So basically, the ability of fish you can get, they can store, and they can harvest, is mitigated by your technology. And at this time, it's mostly piercing technology. Here's some um, beautiful uh, artifacts kind of from that um, from the house that we uh, uh, excavated. And like the Norton time, we see this strategic use of the landscape where um, at the same time that this estuary system was uh, occupied, we also have um, sites on Cape um, Denby. And uh, this is, uh, so this is, uh, the site is uh, in Igak. It was excavated in the 1950s. And we did very, very ephemeral excavations here. Uh, basically, we went back to uh, a 1950s uh, trench that was not closed. Um, if you, this is a, um, an image from Google Earth, you can actually see the trench right here. So 
Um, it kind of really speaks to you know, the shoddy archaeology of the 1950s. And I also want to kind of also um, defend 1950s archaeology. Uh, this archaeologist specifically, J. Lewis Giddings, was even considered shoddy for the time. So even like 1950s archaeologists were, well, I don't know about your methods, man. They're, they're a little coarse grained. But basically, we went, we went back there and we um, sampled this uh, trench. And um, we're basically looking for this fish midden that he identified in the 1950s but did not collect. And it dates back to around um, um, sorry, <laughs> 1370 uh, CE to 1613 CE. And uh, what we're getting so far is that uh, it's mostly dominated by saffron god. Um, so we're still kind of counting through this in the lab, um, but it's mostly saffron cod. We're also getting a lot of what seems to be cloudberries or salmonberries, and also a lot of fly cubera. Um, people are probably not eating the flies, but the idea is that in these coastal systems where people are bringing all this fish and uh, on the coast, and it's transforming the landscape basically, where uh, it's bringing in kind of all these flies that are kind of breaking down the, uh, the bodies of the fish. So kind of once again, we have kind of this kind of dichotomy of landscape use, where an uh, estuary system is more um, focused on Pacific salmon as well as saffron cod that do kind of move up river. But then um, Cape Denby is mostly used by uh, or mostly composed of saffron cod and. Um, um, Sculpin, which seems to reflect kind of a, a fall and summer occupation versus more of kind of a winter occupation at the Cape. So then kind of the next um, occupation area, area is kind of, we're getting this ethnographic period where we have the Yubi peoples uh, who are currently, um, currently inhabited Western Alaska who appear in the area. And this is quite a remarkable time uh, for Alaska prehistory. Um, we have the development of these large, large uh, connected dwellings. You can, you can see kind of several of them are all connected by, um, by tunnels. And I'll kind of get back to that. And what we also see at this time too is that we see technological innovations where we see an increase in netting technology, not just at the site, but across Alaska at this time with innovations in fishing technologies. And something that's interesting uh, at this time as well is that we also, based off of uh, skeletal part representation for uh, sand bones, we start seeing signs of um, storage as well, where, uh, sorry, where certain um, sort of areas of a site seem to be relegated to catching fish while others seem to be um, kind of show signs that people were eating more swordfish. And this is based off of the proportion of uh, salmon cranial elements to uh, their, 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 their uh, spinal cord, uh, their spine. Sorry, their, their, their vertebra. So climatically, what's, what's happening uh, at this time? So we, um, at this kind of, uh, for this uh, period, we have well stratified deposits. And we see that around 1500 AD, there is a huge diversification of uh, the diet. Specifically, we see an increase in the lines of fish, birds, mollusks. Um, we also see kind of new fish kind of enter the diet, specifically herring and flatfish. Uh, so this coincides with technological innovation, but it also coincides with um, a couple other things too. It coincides with the Little Ice Age. So these are um, climatic uh, reconstructions from the Little Ice Age, uh, re re um, reconstructed with uh, fossil beetles from uh, a site right south of us in Nunaluk. But it also coincides with this period of warfare where um, we're getting um, arrowhead caches in some sites. We're also getting, once again, these large interconnected villages. So it seems that with the Little Ice Age, this climactic cooling, you're getting kind of this societal kind of upheaval where there's warfare uh, and uh, there's kind of has this flexibility in food systems where people are now maybe going for fish that they otherwise wouldn't have been going for and it's uh, partially helped with kind of uh, technological innovations. And then kind of lastly, um, this, this is kind of a relic of kind of a passed off uh, 
but we, we, we then see the appearance of the um, of actually Russian traders in, in the area around the 1800s, and they um, kind of brought smallpox and completely decimated coastal human populations. Um, it was it was catastrophic, um, and this area was very much abandoned at that time. So, uh, and, and a lot of kind of language and traditions for this area of the Ubix, um kind of past range is completely lost. But uh, with kind of the abandonment of the area, you didn't have any Ubix people from this, the, the north move in. And um, they're the current, the current inhabitants of the area. And uh, what we kind of see here is that um, at this period, there's much more of an emphasis on fur bearing, uh, uh, sort of uh, fur bearing animals, and this is basically um, an index of uh, fur bearing animals to uh, non fur bearing animals. So this is just counts of bones. So we see that there, there's quite a big increase at this time, and it's thought to be kind of an integration into the market economy. So this, this is kind of like where I kind of would like to kind of expand kind of my current research is to kind of build on kind of this idea of climate change affecting um, kind of these demographic changes in the area uh, and kind of kind of build on like um, increased sampling the area but also um, deriving locally um, kind of specific climate indicators to really tie these demographic changes to uh, climate change. Um, how much time do I have left? Another 10. Another 10? Okay. Sure, I'm, I'm going to finish a little early. So kind of a big kind of message though kind of the long-term resilience of the area seems to be focused on these two fish, a tail of two fish, uh, salmon and saffron cod. So salmon are, are very charismatic, we kind of think of them very often, and in terms of prehistory, they are often uh, in the back of our minds as being kind of this um, high abundant species year round that you can catch enough of them, you can store them for um, the year and kind of sustain yourself. But um, Saffron gods seem to be equally important as well, and this is a species that we don't really talk about much, and is very understudied. So both species have little seasonal overlap, no scheduling conflict. Um, salmon runs are prone to seasonal collapse, while saffron cod are considered a starvation food. They are um, quite resilient. They are actually doing really well in the face of climate change, um, which is a little frustrating for me because I wanted to do this historical ecology studies on saffron cod and how many they're at risk at a uh, climate change, but they, they seem to be pretty, pretty solid. You know, like in the, in the mad uh, max of apocalyptic hellscape that we're going to have, uh, saffron cod will probably still be around. Um, but they're flexible speeders. They're, they're, they're re resilient and they're, they're adaptable. <laughs> so come for salmon, uh, stay for the saffron cod. And uh, this is kind of uh, touching on some research uh, that we've done with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with salmon, where we looked at uh, salmon size through time, and um, kind of looked at kind of our different kind of archaeological phases, and we think we've identified uh, biogeographical changes in salmon distribution. So this is these are the five main species of uh, Pacific salmon. Everyone has their, own, their their favorite, so I'm not going to call anyone else on it. Um, but they all kind of have their own biological, kind of biogeographical um, ranges. Um, but this would change with, uh, with climate change. And we are seeing kind of currently that with uh, climate change, that uh, some species such as uh, king and coho are actually uh, increasing their range northwards with uh, climate change. Um, generally, the species is not doing good, but they're, they're, they're going farther and farther north. So salmon cannot be identified in the archaeological record, but by taking vertebra measurements, um, you can get kind of rough species uh, kind of classes. And um, basically what we found was that in warmer periods, there seems to be higher degrees of uh, salmon overlap. And um, while cooler periods seem to have be more concentrated on kind of smaller um, salmon, which uh, are either pink or soft eye, but kind of given the current bio geography of the area is likely pink. So it seems that in kind of past cooling and warming events in the area may have uh, reduced salmon populations. So um, that may contribute kind of these kind of population dips that we kind of see during cooling events in the area.
Yeah, so um, on the other hand, Saffron Goth, they are epibenthic feeders. They are found uh, uh, basically from the Mackenzie Delta down to British Columbia. Um, and uh, they are quite adaptable. They're uh, near shore fish, they move near shore um, to spawn. And they're typically caught in the winter and the fall. And they're important from a, um, a, a, a an ecological standpoint because they're very much this web, or sorry, this link. Come on. This link that uh, connects the the benthos to kind of the pelagic and near shore systems. So they are kind of the, the, this link that um, kind of ties everything together. So this is ongoing research, but we've run a stable uh, isotopes on uh, some of our archaeological examples uh, done by Paul Spock. He is not uh, typically this intimidating. Um, he's quite a nice man. Um, but what we found was that um, this, this, this is kind of we'll, we'll kind of feed into things that um, so uh, carbon and nitrogen uh, are indicators of. Um, so carbon is an indicator of where you're getting your um, um, energy from. So it's typically kind of an indicator of uh, productivity. So um, in this case, it is for marine environments, it's we'll kind of indi indicated if it's freshwater, pelagic, or benthic. So basically depleted carbon will be more terrestrial and moving up to freshwater, pelagic, to benthic, that will be more enriched. While nitrogen is um, higher in um, is an indicator of trophic levels. So basically, species that have high trophic levels are um, um, will have higher nitrogen. So kind of what I want to kind of talk about here is basically that when we're talking thinking about stable systems, stable food systems, it's not only about having diverse food webs, but it's also targeting species that they themselves draw their energy from diverse food webs, right? So we, we at least with our kind of our two main species, um, saffron cod and salmon, that kind of the fisheries we're targeting. There's their two species that are, are kind of in distinct kind of different food webs. So um, it's a strategy where if one system collapses, you might kind of have um, the other one to rely on. So uh, stability is not only about kind of diversity of prey items, but also diversity of kind of where those prey items get their uh, their uh, energy from. And if anyone's, I'm not going to kind of spend time on this, but if anyone's kind of curious about um, why saffron cod's nitrogen levels are so high, I have some ideas. But if you have any idea, you know, if you're a, kind of a, a reader, a student of uh, carbon and nitrogen ice steps, this should get, this should shock you a little bit. Why it's so high? Um, so kind of a, a, a few kind of like lessons that I kind of have from this uh, talk that I would like to, to build on is um, at least in North Sound, diversified food systems seem to promote uh, resilience. Uh, not only diversified food systems, but food systems that draw their energy from diverse. Uh, Sources, um, emphasis on low trophic level species, and I kind of plugged in this book that came out by um, Brent Smith, "Eat Like a Fish," basically uh, looking at kind of how stable fisheries through time will focus on low trophic species that are quick to reproduce versus kind of targeting high trophic level species. Uh, adaptable technologies, so we kind of see, um, especially with, with netting technology coming in, being used for several things. Flexible settle, settle structures, seasonal landscape use. And kind of future research, uh, as I mentioned, uh, like to increase serving the area, like to kind of derive a more uh, archaeological specific uh, indicators of kind of climatic proxies, but uh, more of a study of why these systems fail. Um, I didn't really get into that. Uh, just kind of talk about resilience. And yeah, so with that said, thank you so much for the talk. Um, as I prefaced, I had like two days to really work on this, so it's kind of a rush. But uh, I'm really happy for this opportunity. So uh, questions, and I was told that uh, students, please give me your questions first, uh, and then we can kind of uh, funnel through uh, others. Thank you. Yeah, ask away. Fascinating stuff. Very different from things. Go ahead, Julia. So from uh, looking at these different time periods and the artifacts, can you see differences in, like, Gender roles or anything from this artifact? Yeah, the, so the, that's a really good question. So can we see gender roles uh, with the artifacts? And um, this is not like an analysis that we that we specifically did, 
but uh, you definitely can with the archaeological record. And something to think about, especially with um, small game, like saffron cod, mussel harvesting, is that at least ethnographically, so like uh, from historic records, um, and I have previous this, it's always problems with kind of using the ethnographic record as an analogy for like a past peoples. Um, those food items were collected by um, either women and children. So um, kind of one kind of do fine, uh, fine screen soil um, sampling and also start looking at kind of non-traditional food items. It reveals kind of the actual kind of uh, kind of importance and kind of labor inputs that uh, women and children had in societies where they, they, they traditionally think of like big game hunters and like men the hunter, but in reality like berry picking, uh, muscle harvesting, saffron cod jigging were, were all done by, uh, by uh, most of the women. Um, and with uh, gender roles, with that men's house, the artifacts we're getting in that men's house, it was all kind of associated with tool production. Um, and w which are mostly like, traditionally associated with uh, with uh, with men's work. So in, I think you've got to land on an interesting kind of subject that I, I haven't kind of thought of yet. It's like kind of looking at how many climate change might affect on shifting gender roles. And that's something I would love to kind of think more about in the future. Yeah. Very cool. Good questions. Yes? Uh, if you could go back to the slide right before the one that said the tail of the you want to look at more Paul Spock? No? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this one. So the population decline right around 750, is that kind of, ex like, is that the same time period that the volcanic eruption on the Alaskan Peninsula took place? So, so that, that was over here. Okay. Uh, that's not included in this figure. I, I typically kind of work in kind of this, uh, um, period from uh, 500 BCE to uh, present, but I kind of included kind of earlier stuff because uh, it was an interesting model. But th that that is not um, accounting that take that account. But I can uh, kind of go all the way to Andy Tremaine's data. And in terms of climate, um, there is um, sorry, hopefully. No one gets, uh, yeah. Um, in terms of climate, it's actually, uh, there's a slight cooling happening at this time too. And there's also um, actual sea ice anomalies happening at this time as well. So cooling climates may have been kind of in play or happening in construction. And I think it's important when we're, we're kind of thinking of these models that there's, there's no kind of silver bullet that will, will kind of lead to subtle collapse. Probably a couple things all playing together. Yeah. And then on the prior slide, that temperature scale, was that local to Norton Sound? Uh, which one? Uh, so on the no, so, so th those, those were, those were um, um, global uh, Greenlandic uh, ice core data. Um, the, the, um, ice, the ice data is, is from the North Texas Sea, so that, that's more local. Um, and honestly, the, there was data that just came out. Um, go to the map nearby. Yeah from uh, St. Michael's Island, oh, or St. Michael's, which is around here, on local climate data sets. Um, so, future docs will integrate that. Uh, and, um, I think, but, you know, generally, there seems to be a, kind of a um, agreement with kind of global climate data sets and kind of what's happening in Western Alaska. Honestly, um, my current work is building um, local climate proxies based off of, um, uh, fish uh, otoliths, so uh, kind of uh, fish otoliths that were kind of the archaeological uh, record. We uh, or, or we drilled them um, last week, I guess, for uh, aragonite powder for oxygenized stuff to start kind of building kind of more locally uh, relevant uh, climate indicators. And that's, uh, my my dream is also then to kind of bring in um, mussel shell as well, so we can kind of get a better idea of kind of what's happening uh, or. or climate data from human context instead of kind of relying on proxies. It's fascinating. I had a similar thought about how coherent is the climate like, I mean, I guess the big picture stuff doesn't make sense. And, you know, we know that some aspects of the Little Ice Age are, um, are, are concentrated in northern Europe and how widespread some of these effects are. 
<laughs> yeah, and the place age is an interesting one too. And unfortunately, like, there, there's still work to be done um, in Western Alaska and the Western Arctic in general, but you do kind of see at a few sites that there seems to be something going around at the Little Ice Age where uh, fisheries diversify, you have warfare, uh, and, and it's a couple sites going on, so it would be nice to uh, start kind of connecting these nodes. Right. Yeah, cause I mean, the thing that struck me is being completely outsider to this type of work is yeah. like, yeah, how do you separate out climate for a conflict, for a disease? Exactly. Yeah. Population increases, mm -hmm. and like, yeah. yeah. So. else? Okay, well with that, and I'll thank you again.